Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am joining you from North Carolina, where there may, at some point here on the coast, be a very loud thunderstorm. So if you hear something in the background, that might be it. So hopefully I will, con I will keep my connection and all will be well. Um, as Kenny said, I'm Emily Gorham, the Director for Content for the Digital Public Library of America, and um, I had the pleasure of um, co-chairing the working group that developed writestatements.org, and I'm going to chat with you a little bit today, um, along with Greg Cram, who worked closely on that working group with me, um, about um, right statements and the statements themselves, and a little bit about um, the DPLA implementation. I'm going to start off by reviewing a little bit from uh, last time, um, especially for those of you who weren't necessarily able to join us. This will just be a quick um, overview. For those of you who were able to join us, um, there won't be too much overlap, so hopefully we won't bore you too much. So just to review what we did um, last week, what we talked about last week. So WriteStatements.org is a project um, that Europeana and DPLA networks came together um, to create in consultation with um, Creative Commons. The main goal in developing WriteStatements.org was to provide standardized, consistent, accurate information about rights status to the users of our digital content, which of course we don't currently do. Currently, the rights field, um, for most of us at least in our digital collections, um, is, um, is free text. And we put a lot of things in there. One of the things I reviewed in the first day is that we actually have more words in the rights statements field than in any other field in the DPLA aggregation. Um, that includes description. Um, that was one of the most shocking things when we had um, when we had some some folks from the outside actually do some data analysis on the DPLA data in aggregate, um, that was one of the results that was returned, that there were more words in the right statements field than any other field. Um, and I knew we said a lot about rights, but I didn't know we said more than we did about description. So um, we often like to say, put a lot of things in that field. Some of that information is rights information, and some of it's not. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some of the complications around that other information we've tended to put in that field. So talking more about that whole aggregate um, collection at DPLA, um, right now we have a little over 13 million records. And in those 13 million records, um, based on a sample set that we've, we've done, we believe that there are approximately 100,000 different right statements um, categorized, at least similarly, in use in the Digital Public Library of America. Obviously, that's a lot of statements. And um, when you have that many statements, there is not a lot of control that you can have over those statements. Um, so. 100,000 different statements um, certainly means we can't do things like facet by those or provide a list of everything in the public domain, for example. Those things would be extremely challenging um, based on the different statements that we use currently. Um, our users are often confused by many, if not most, of the statements that we use. Um, your organization certainly may be an exception to this, but Many, um, many actually have vague statements. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples, um, and one in particular of a of a very vague statement. Um, and and you may have more kind of generic information in that field than you do information about actual right status of the digital object. One of the keys going forward for us is accuracy. Um, and Greg's going to um, follow me in just a second and talk a little bit about the key principles of the right statements themselves when we develop them. But accuracy is one of the tenets of, that the DPLA is, is very um, passionate about, let's say. We want to make sure that um, we're doing as accurate a job as possible when we assign the right statements. 
So mapping what we currently have in our write statements field to a statement offered at writestatements.org might be simple if you had statements that had already been checked for accuracy and if you had write statuses that were actually clear. Of all the DPLA partners, likely only the New York Public Library, who happens to employ Greg Cram, is in that current situation. Most of our partners have to have to work within an environment that doesn't actually have um, an IP expert on, on staff, and they have to do the best that they can with the statements that they provide. Um, so we certainly know that um, people are going to have to work within their own bounds, um, but that we want to impress upon um, the network, and, and I think be, even beyond the DPLA network, I think the key here is to get for our users when they find digital materials online, for them to know as accurately as possible what they can and cannot do with the materials that they find. Um, and let's not add any extra rights on top of that. Let's talk about the rights of the actual material themselves and not add any rights when we don't have to as cultural heritage organizations. We're in the business to share. Um, that's that's our goal. We we didn't we didn't sign up for uh, being cultural heritage professionals for the money. We signed up because we love this stuff and we want to share the cultural riches of our organizations with others. Here's a couple of examples of right statements um, that we find in the DPLA. Um, so you'll see I've written here. So this is a map of South Carolina. This map is actually from 1830. Um, and it's obviously not produced by the University of South Carolina. I'm not even sure they were open in 1830. Um, but in the right statement field, you'll actually see digital copyright 2013, the University of South Carolina, all rights reserved. Um, this right statement should say public domain United States at minimum. Um, so I think that we certainly need to work on the accuracy of our statements and this is where I'm talking about not adding any extra rights on top um, because we've put something on a scanner and pressed a button. We haven't created a new copyright. We've simply made a digital facsimile of that item and put that item online and we need to maintain the rights of the original item. Here's another statement example in the DPLA. Um, this is one. Of, this is one that probably added to that uh, fact that I gave you that there are a lot of words in the right statement field. Um, this pretty much tells us nothing about right status. <laughs> it says send request to address given, and or you can contract us via this website, which may or may not change, of course, and I, I see, for example, that this website is using PHP, and that's certainly something we know that often changes over time. Um, we've got a phone number, those certainly change, um, and then we've got another URL down here at the bottom. So in this particular write statement, we have a lot of contact information, um, which may or may not be currently accurate, but we don't really have anything that tells us anything about the right statement itself. So I think this is, um, this is a problematic right statement and one that the institution, when they actually go to assign rightstatements.org statements, is really going to have to go back and analyze and figure out what statement they're going to assign because it's not clear here based on this right statement what they would map the right statement to um, of the available rightstatements.org statements. So, this is obviously why we spent most of our time during the first webinar talking about copyright um, because copyright is what's really important to understand so that we can actually appropriately accurately assign rights statements. And that's why we're going to talk about it some more today. 
So up next, here's Johnny. I'm just kidding for those of you. Those, most people probably never watch Johnny Carson anyway. But anyway, <laughs> for those of you who didn't, here's Greg. Um, Greg's going to talk to you a little bit more about, uh, about right statements um, themselves. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg or have Kenny do so. Let's see. Stop sharing my screen. All right. Yeah. All right. So thanks, Emily. Uh, so that's Emily went over kind of the reasons why we uh, why we went to writestatements.org, why we were thinking about write statements, and how we how we developed it. We also talked a lot about yesterday about um, copyright issues. Um, so I'm going to just do a quick review of copyright, uh, the things that we covered last time and uh, talk about uh, the contract issues that we talked about and then start to get into the, the real content for this session. Uh, so first, let's start with the review. Um, let's start with the copyright review. So to help with the accuracy of these statements, we then got into a lot of copyright fundamentals in the last session. We discussed how the Constitution laid the foundation of copyright law. We discussed how original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression are protected by copyright law, and they're protected by copyright law at the moment of their creation. We also highlighted that a modicum or small amount of creativity is required to trigger copyright protection, which means that the reproductions that Emily was just talking about, the, the just simply hitting the button on the scanner or taking a photograph of a two-dimensional object when the goal is to just create a slavish reproduction of it, all of those things are not likely to inure a new copyright to the institution photographing them. We also talked about the bundle of rights that a rights holder owns when they create a work protected by copyright. And a bundle of rights, the, the exclusive rights that a rights holder gets are the rights to do something and to prevent others from doing something. And those rights are the rights to prevent uh, others from copying their works, um, to create derivatives of those works, to distribute those works, and to publicly perform or display those works. So those are the exclusive rights that a rights holder gets. But those rights are balanced against a set of exceptions and limitations to those exclusive rights. We'll talk more about fair use uh, in much more in depth later in this session, but we talked about some of the exceptions and limitations out there. We talked about the library exceptions that underlie a lot of the work that we do at libraries. We talked about uh, the blind and print disabled exceptions in section 121, and other uh, fair uh, first sale doctrine, uh, the first sale doctrine exception that's out there that allows libraries to lend books. So let's talk about, uh, oh, we also talked about ownership, sorry. We also cover copyright ownership. And we said that the normally the copyright ownership begins with the author of a book. The one rare exception to that is when we have um, a work made for hire. We also noted that copyright can be sold, transferred, or assigned to others, similar to how physical property can be transferred. We talked about the duration of copyright protection in the United States and how it's only gotten longer over time. We're going to spend a good chunk of time in this session talking about the protection under US law and about the duration of that protection and how we might be able to use the rules that are out there to identify more works that are in the public domain than we currently have identified. We also discussed how a single item can have multiple copyrights in that item. So for example, a sound recording uh, is usually, comp it has two level, layer of rights. Uh, the first layer is the composition, which is the underlying notes. And the second layer is the performance of those notes, so the band playing the, the song. We wrapped up the copyright session by discussing remedies for copyright infringement, which include uh, damages for actual profits, statutory damages, and an injunction where a court can order you to stop doing something. We then moved into uh, contract essentials. Although copyright law sets the default rules we all play by, we talked about how contracts can change these defaults. Rights holders can grant additional permissions to use their works to individuals or even the general public by using a Creative Commons license. 
Only rights holders can approve of these additional uses, so only they can apply the Creative Commons licenses. We also discuss the flip side of granting more permission, which is restricting use. We can have restrictions on how we use the material, and those restrictions can be imposed by anyone, including donors who might not actually own rights, or digitization partners who maybe want periods of exclusivity before you are allowed to make uh, those items available online. As we talk through the statements today, you'll see how this background information informs much of uh, how we apply the statements. And as always, um, any information you hear today should not be construed as legal advice. All right, so that's enough review. Let's get into today's session. So here's where we're going today. We're going to start off talking about the principles behind the right statements. So in this group formed that Emily talked about that she co-chaired, um, we came up with a set of principles that we wanted to use to guide our work on creating the right statements. We'll then review the right statements and get into each of the statements, um, talk about what they are and what they aren't. Emily will then talk about DPL DPLA implementation plans, how we're actually going to implement these rights. And then we're going to get into what's actually in the public domain in the United States. We'll talk about some of the formalities that were imposed during certain periods of our copyright law that may have actually tripped rights holders up to the point where things may be in the public domain. We'll also then uh, get into the in-copyright statements. Uh, in particular, we'll highlight the Orphan Works statement and talk about how fair use might play into an Orphan Works decision. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some examples, actual examples from DPLA, um, and decide which statements to apply to those particular, uh, th those works that have been included in DPLA. All right, so for all of the problems that Emily highlighted, um, it's clear that we needed a way to standardize how we communicate rights issues with our users. So all of us came together, the DPLA and Europeana brought together a group of experts, and we talked through um, some founding principles for the project. The first founding principle was that we wanted to capture at a very high level the most common rights situations for items made available through DPLA and Europeana. We wanted to identify what the most particular, the most common rights statements uh, are used and how we might be able to simplify those statements. We wanted to keep the number of statements low and manageable to limit complexity. We want to avoid the situation we're in today where more words are spent describing copyright issues than actually describing the object. We want to avoid exposing our users to over 100,000 unique rights statements that they can barely understand, and as Emily discussed, uh, are awfully uh, confusing. We also wanted to strike a balance between making these as friendly to end users. Um, we wanted to balance that, that user experience against the legal obligations and implications of sharing copyright status determinations. That means we try to limit the legal jargon as much as possible, but still include a little bit to make our general counsels and others um, more comfortable in using these statements. So our first principle was to make these statements as simple as we could. The second principle was to keep these statements flexible. As we talked about in the last session, there is no international copyright law. Instead, we have about 200 different national copyright laws that we have to work with. These statements need to be able to work in some capacity for as many of these countries as possible, and therefore need to be flexible. We also wanted to limit the number of country-specific right statements to a very small number. Otherwise, we get statements multiplying and get back into the same situation we're in today. We also needed to be flexible for institutions who will be assigning these statements to their items. You'll see how some of these statements give institutions the option and ability to add additional data on their sites about the specific limitations or permissions that they've agreed to from rights holders or from others. And finally, we needed these statements to be flexible uh, so that we can update the statements as needed. Um, we may have gotten some things wrong. We hope we didn't, but we may have gotten some things wrong. So we want to make sure that the, there's a way for the process to be updated, for the statements to be updated, so that we can just keep going and have these statements um, adapt to, to future uh, situations. 
The third principle was they needed to be descriptive. We need to describe the copyright status of the work as evaluated by the contributing institution. We don't want to be in the business of providing legal advice, but we do want to help all our users make their own decisions. That means we need to be descriptive about what the right status is and not proscriptive um, about telling people whether a particular use is a fair use or not. These statements are not meant to weigh in on whether a work can be used under specific limitations and exceptions, and, and therefore it just needs to be a, a way to describe the copyright status and potentially uh, restrictions or additional permissions granted uh, by, by the, inst by the uh, rights holders or by third parties. But it is meant, these statements are meant in specific cases where the rights holder is authorized reuse to communicate that, that authorization appropriately. The next principle was that we wanted these statements to be accurate. As Emily said, we want these statements to be as accurate as possible. Because there are so many different types of intellectual property, we wanted to limit our focus solely to copyright. If we didn't limit our focus to copyright, we would either have many permutations of a statement or would just simply have inaccurate statements. Therefore, we chose to have accurate statements, so we stripped out the rights of publicity, rights of privacy, trademark, and trade secrets information that you might uh, undertake on your own. We stripped that out of the right statements to make them as easy and simple as possible for our users. The last principle was that we wanted to make these statements transparent. They need to apply not just to the work, but to the digital item that's been contributed. That means that when an institution has agreed to a restriction on the use of the object, it should be noted in the rights statement. We recognize that institutions sometimes agree with rights holders or digitization partners to add restrictions so they can make them available online. The hope is, of course, that these restrictions are as limited as possible and for as short a time as possible. But we knew that these, these our cultural heritage partners would have these issues and we wanted to uh, make the statements transparent enough that it was clear to our users what was going on. Transparency also meant encouraging institutions not to add new restrictions beyond those required by copyright law or contract law. In other words, just like Emily said, we don't want to have institutions adding more restrictions when they're not required to by copyright or contract law. Okay, so that's the, uh, those are the founding principles that we operated when we created rightstatements.org. Um, and you'll recall from last time, there were three main categories of rights statements that we created. We're gonna walk through each of these categories and, and identify each of the statements in the categories. I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about the, the individual statements, and then we'll get into later in the session about how those statements will work or how they operate, how we anticipate them operating in practice. So let's start with the in copyright statements. The first statement is in copyright. Uh, that is exactly what it sounds like. The item itself is protected by copyright law. It's the vanilla version of in copyright for us. The second statement is in copyright EU orphan work. This indicates that the item has been identified as an orphan work under the terms of the EU orphan works directive. It's targeted toward institutions can, that can actually use the directive. That means, for the most part, EU institutions. It indicates that the item has been identified as in copyright, but its rights holders either cannot be identified or can't be located. We don't expect US partners to be using this statement very often, if at all, um, we, and we expect instead that the Europeana uh, colleagues, counterparts, and, and hubs will be using this statement when they identify a work that's consistent with the directive. The other reason why we don't think U.S. institutions will use the EU Orphan Work Initiative is because we have our own uh, Orphan Work Statement, and that's the third statement, which is in copyright rights holders unlocatable or unidentifiable. This is uh, for all of the other countries who might have Orphan Works but don't have a specific directive like the EU has. The fourth statement is in copyright educational uses permitted. This indicates that the item is in copyright, but that the educational use is allowed without the need to obtain additional permission from the rights holders. This will happen likely in situations where a rights holder has permitted the, institutions, the institution to allow users to make educational uses 
of items without needing to go back to the rights holder each time. The fifth in copyright statement is in copyright non-commercial use permitted. This indicates that the item is in copyright, but the non-commercial uses have been permitted by the rights holder without the need to obtain additional permission. Again, this is likely because the rights holder has given, institution, given the institution um, the ability or has allowed them to make the item available for others to use for non-commercial purposes. For both of these statements, we would encourage contributing institutions to note what the, what the parameters are of those licenses on their site um, so that it's clear to users what we mean by educational use. Um, these educational use and non-commercial uses aren't defined by rightstatements.org, instead they're meant to be kind of guideposts and, and indicate that an educational use or non-commercial use is permitted. We hope and expect that uh, local institutions will, will add to the, the data uh, on their side, on their, their, their website, and indicate what the, what the additional permissions are. Okay, so let's talk about the things that are no copyright have, or are in the public domain. The first statement is out of copyright, non-commercial use only. This indicates that the work is in the public domain, but that the organization that's published the work or made the work available is contractually required to allow only non-commercial uses by third parties. We expect this statement to be used primarily by counterparts in Europeana who have books that were digitized under a private par public private partnership uh, with primarily Google Books. So when Google Books digitized the, the books in European institutions, those European institutions agreed to a restriction on the downstream uses of those, those books um, for a limited amount of time. Uh, this statement would, could be used by U.S. institutions who have a similar restriction either through Google Books or through other uh, non-third-party vendors who limit downstream uses to non-commercial uses. The second statement is no copyright contractual restrictions. It indicates that the underlying work is in the public domain, but that the organization has, that has published the item is contractually required to restrict certain forms of use by third parties. This is usually because of donor agreements or other digitization agreements. And again, we, we expect and uh, encourage our hubs to note what those contractual restrictions are on the item page, or at least link out from the item page to what those restrictions actually look like. The third no copyright statement is no copyright other known legal restrictions. This indicates that the work is in the public domain, but that there are known restrictions imposed by laws other than copyright on the use of the item by third parties. Again, this is targeted institutions who are primarily outside the US who have laws that protect things like traditional cultural expressions. Those laws are very copyright-like, but they're not exactly copyright laws. So we needed to identify, uh, have, a, have a way for institutions to identify those issues. And the fourth no copyright is no copyright United States. And again, this sounds exactly like it, it looks. It indicates that the work is in the public domain, at least under the laws of the US. It doesn't preclude the, the item from being in the public domain in other countries. It means, though, that the institution who make, is making that statement has evaluated at least the United States issues and determined the work to be in the public domain in the United States. The third broad category of rights statements are the other rights statements, and we'll walk through these real quick. So the first one is no known copyright. The no known copyright indicates that the data provider believes that no copyright or related rights are known to exist for the item, but that a conclusive determination could not be made. That means that the institution who's applying this statement was unable to reach a conclusion or was lacking some key piece of information to be able to make a public domain statement. So this isn't exactly a statement that we expect um, users to rely on very heavily because it's in the other category and not in the no, the no copyright category. But we do expect it to be helpful for uh, institutions who have lots of archival collections with older material where the publication status isn't clear. The second other, copy, other right statement is copyright not evaluated. This indicates that the data provider has not evaluated the copyright and related rights status of the item. It means they just simply haven't evaluated it and haven't looked. 
at the very end we'll talk about when the use of this statement might, might be appropriate, but it's not always clear when uh, someone will use this statement. The third right statement that is not yet on the website but will be soon is copyright undetermined. Although not currently on the menu, we expect this to be available to hubs very soon. And the goal of this statement is to, uh, to be used only when no copyright status could be determined. Um, this will be used primarily um, when you've got a situation where it's almost 50-50 whether the item is in copyright or not. It means that you've looked at the copyright status but just weren't able to make a conclusion either way or even an indication either way whether the work is protected by copyright. So those are the rights statements themselves from rightstatements.org. Um, each of those statements has some additional notices um, that we added to, to keep the legal jargon low, but also to keep the lawyers happy. So the first notice that you'll see on every rights statement is that there are no warranties behind these statements. Um, unlike licenses, where uh, the Creative Commons license in particular, where there's, there's some meat behind it, uh, in this case, there's no, there are no warranties being issued by the institution. They're not saying uh, that you can blame us or you can sue us if we get this, we, we made a, a mistake. The second notice is that other rights may apply. If you recall from the principles section, we, we wanted to be clear that we are only talking about copyright issues. There may be other rights implicated by your use, including rights of privacy, rights of publicity, moral rights and trademark rights, but these statements don't cover those rights. And as a user, you should be looking to determine whether your uses in, implicate those other kinds of rights. The third notice that you'll often see is additional information about the right status may be found on the contributor's website. At no time should this additional information be in conflict with the right statement, but it's always nice to have additional information about the right statement or about the data that was used to get to the right statement. So those are the right statements uh, that, we, that we created with this process, but all of these right statements are meant to work in conjunction uh, and live in parallel with the Creative Commons licenses. The, these are different because CC licenses are applied by the rights holder, and in most cases that's not the institution making the item available. Even the public domain tools from Creative Commons, like the CC0 and the public domain mark, will be accepted as valid right statements. We'll talk a little bit later about the differences between the public domain mark and the other no copyright flavors, but I just want to note for you here that the, right state, the reason why rightstatements.org is missing a vanilla, plain public domain statement is because Creative Commons has already created one. So here are the, the menu, the list of statements that we anticipate DPLA hubs using. So all the, the in copyright statements that are highlighted in orange, the public domain, uh, no copyright statements highlighted in green, including the CC's public domain mark. The kind of other statements uh, that are in blue, which are the no known, not evaluated, and determined. And lastly, the CC licenses and the CCO dedication. Uh, so you'll notice that the, the public domain mark is included here, and we'll talk more about the public domain mark here in a few minutes. So I'm going to hand this back over to Emily to discuss the DPLA implementation of these slides, or, uh, I'm sorry, of these statements, and how DPLA is going to uh, make these statements uh, work. So I'll turn this back over to Emily. All right. So Greg talked to you about um, the actual uh, statements themselves. So glad we dove into that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the implementation side of things. So we're going to um, we're going to start with willing partners at at DPLA. So um, we had a question um, during the last webinar that um, was. We hadn't gotten to, um, we, have, we hadn't stated the obvious, uh, I think, um, in that yes, the goal is for uh, the DPLA network to implement these statements. That's, that's absolutely the goal. Um, we're going to start that process um, in, in a phased approach. Um, we are going to start with willing partners. Um, and 
New York Public Library will be that first partner that we work with because um, they already have statements that have been reviewed for accuracy. We talked about that accuracy being key. Um, they also have clear statements and, and a, a whole mapping key um, that, that Greg has come up with at NYPL. Um, and so it's he's got those the key that he has in his system already mapped over to um, writestatements.org statements and NYPL will be using writestatements.org statements as their exclusive statements um, on their on their website. Um, so that they'll be the first hub we actually work with and we implement writestatements.org so soon you'll be able to see um, those statements appear in the NYPL data on dp.la and through um, our API. Um, most of our hubs, however, uh, don't have a dedicated IP lawyer like Greg, so these things are going to take them a little time and um, are going to take some education as well. Many of our hubs have um, small partners um, who, who certainly um, don't necessarily know a whole lot about um, copyright status. So we'll, we'll be working with kind of those institutions to begin to, to help their partners um, accurately assign statements. Um, we know that risk profiles at our institutions are going to be different. Um, we know that some people are willing to, um, for example, say things are clearly in the public domain. Um, others may be more comfortable saying no known rights. Um, and it just really depends. And, and people are going to, to have their different comfort levels. Greg talked last time about, um, you know, in different situations, and he's, and he's going to end, end today talking about some scenarios. In different situations, depending on your institutional risk, you may choose one statement over another one. Um, and that's OK as long as that accurately um, describes the right status uh, to the best of your ability. The main goal is for us to strive for that accuracy and eventually completeness. Um, we really want to have all of the statements in the DPLA use writestatements.org. We think that that is going to take a while. Um, we know that that's not going to happen overnight. If it happened overnight, then the accuracy portion would certainly um, not be there. We can't take what's there now and map that to an obvious statement in at least a quarter of the cases, probably more like a half of the cases. So um, last time I kind of gave a summary of um, the statuses in DPLA and over 25% of the current status um, of the right statements is, is totally unclear. We wouldn't even know what to map um, because there's not enough information. Kind of like that University of Southern California statement I showed with all of that contact information there. Um, so that is, um, that's where there's, I think, um, some work that really needs to happen on the part of the institutions to determine accuracy and to determine which statement they should apply. Um, so they're going to have to go back and look at these records and we know that that is certainly going to take time. Um, likely somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two years is what we're thinking um, regarding an implementation timeline. Um, during the first day, I talked about Europeana's implementation timeline, and I kind of showed where they started. And it, when they when they implemented their original Europeana licensing framework, um, and that um, took them three years, but they had a few more records than we did than we're starting with. So um, we're we're um, I think setting setting a goal of of two years, and um, we certainly may or may not reach that, but we want to. Um, we want to try, and I think our partners um, want to do so as well, because they want users to know what they can and cannot do with information when they find it. Um, so we have held one training already. So um, this these this two part ninety minute um, sessions um, are kind of a condensed version of what we did at uh, the DPLA Fest um, just in April, uh, just last month. We held a workshop all day long for our, our service hubs that could attend, um, and 
we gave them a lot of information about the statements and scenarios around applying them and talking about um, the copyright law itself. And we also talked about some of the examples in their hubs and what might be challenges. Um, we expect this education um, and training effort to continue. Um, we haven't held um, any, any kind of training yet for our service hubs and we haven't worked with anyone beyond kind of the hub level partners. So for example, um, our service hubs, some of them have more than 200 partners. So how to get the data accurate at that lower partner level within the service hubs is going to be part of the key. So um, we'll be working with them to, um, to use some training materials to get those folks um, as trained as best as possible to be able to assign some of these statements. There are a few complicating factors that I'll, that I'll chat about a little bit around implementation. Um, so the statements themselves are URIs. So we wanted to, um, we wanted to comply with best practices for op linked open data. And so those, those statements are published as URIs. And that's how we'd really like to receive um, that that data from our partners, the URIs in a distinct rights field. Um, so not with other information that we have to parse out, but in a field by itself, um, in a rights field by itself. Um, and that's how we'd prefer to get those um, URIs. So we'll be working with our partners to determine kind of based on their system, um, based on their mapping capabilities, those kinds of things, what what field that, that comes to us in is, is that DC rights, is that, um, so some of you that might be familiar with our metadata schema, is that EDM rights, which stands for European Data Model, which is, um, which we use some of those fields inside of the DPLA metadata application profile. So where does that rights statement URI actually come to us, and then how do we get that when we ingest your data, and then um, we would turn that in, we would, we would display that, um, that statement on the DPLA website. Um, there, there's also the complication around the extra information. I'll go back again to that example earlier that I gave um, from the University of Southern California where there was a lot of contact information in that field. Um, a lot of the right statements in the DPLA that that kind of has been a trend I think in um, in our um, cultural heritage institutions when we have assigned rights we've often um, expressed status as well as contact information um, so what do we do with that contact information because it's not really rights information right um, so is it necessary for us to map that at the DPLA level and to display that? Um, is that extra information that you would just want at your local level so that when people click on your information that they can get that? Um, is that something we point back to or is that something we actually need to map up at the DPLA level? And if so, we think it needs to go somewhere besides the rights field. So we need to work with our partners to determine if that needs to be mapped at the DPLA level, where does that go um, and, and how do we provide those, that kind of extra information that folks may want to provide. Um, we will work through these issues with our partners um, and then as we work through some of these issues with our partners, we'll, we'll um, we'll let the broader community know about those implementation decisions that we're making. So um, the, the short answer is we don't have implementation all figured out at this point. Um, we, we need to work through some of the challenges of systems. So some of your systems actually don't um, currently handle URIs or they don't really do anything with them. Um, and we need to work through um, working with some of our partners that have those systems and figuring out um, if they can't use the URI, what 
what kind of unique identifier would they use, and then how would we turn that into the URI, um, and those kinds of things. So I think there's definitely some challenges around implementation that we are going to need to figure out on a case-by-case basis. Um, but luckily, we have some hubs that have already volunteered, and some that have some um, different systems that they run so that we can work through some of the challenges um, around implementation and then hopefully from that be able to extrapolate and, and make some rep recommendations for the entire network. Um, you know, here's the best case scenario. This is what we'd prefer you to do. If you can't do this, this is the next option. Um, and then we'll address, obviously, that contact information and additional information and whether or not that needs to be at the DPLA level or whether or not that remains at the individual provider level. So those are some of the challenges around implementation that we're looking for, but hopefully within the next um, few months we'll actually start showing write statements from NYPL and then we'll begin to work with some of our other partners to um, address um, some of the challenges here um, and then be able to roll out the statements gradually over time. Once we get a critical mass of statements in the DPLA, you'll see us implement a facet on rights. Um, during the first day, I actually showed what that would look like. So if you're familiar with the DPLA website now, around down the left-hand side, we actually have facets where you can facet by things like subject or um, or location or other kinds of information. Now you'd be, once we have rights information that is controlled instead of 100,000 different statuses, we'd be able to actually facet by that rights information. So once we get that controlled information coming in um, to us and most of our data or a significant amount of our data has those rights statements, then we'll be, we'll provide that facet for use as well. So, um, Look, look for more from us around implementation guidelines, um, and again, if you are a hub or a part of a hub, we, um, we look to start you know, increasing training and for working with hubs to actually work with their partners to, um, to begin to talk to folks on how to choose these statements and implement them locally. So I'm going to turn this back over um, to Kenny and Greg. All right, thanks, Melissa. I'm Emily. Oh, I did it again. Uh, thanks, Emily. Um, so let's talk about the public domain. So in, in the public domain in the United States, uh, there's a few reasons why something might actually be in the public domain. Um, for example, things might be in the public domain because the duration of copyright protection has expired. So we're going to talk through the U.S. duration rules and how you might be able to find items that are are actually in the public domain that were published after 1923. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, the, the problems the, that we normally encounter with archival material in determining this, their status. So uh, you saw this chart in the last session. Um, we, when we started off uh, copyright law in the United States, copyright was uh, 14 years, lasted 14 years from the date of publication. Uh, with an option to renew at the end of 14 years for another 14. So 28 years in total um, from the date of publication, but you had to do a little bit of work. Since then, the, the Congress has saw fit to extend the duration of protection all the way to life plus 70, which is today. The term of copyright protection so far has only gone one way, and that's to increase the term. But as Congress was going through and adding copyright duration, um, they when they flipped in 1976 from a date of publication starting the clock to a life plus regime, um, it added some complexity when we're trying to calculate how long something will be protected by copyright law. 1923 is a great starting point right now for published items um, because that means anything published before 1923 in the United States is in the public domain. But if we stick with 1923 as our hard and fast rule, then we're missing some really important opportunities. Uh, so despite what you may have heard, there's a lot of material published after 1923 that is in fact in the public domain. You've got to do some work to verify that it is in fact in the public domain, but it's very much possible. 
In fact, the copyright review and management system uh, the project over at Michigan has successfully made determinations for over 330,000 books that are in the Hathi Trust repository. There are a few tools that we can use to find things that are actually in the public domain that were published after this date. Now, the first tool, uh, the first set of tools are called formalities. So before you can legally drive, you need to obtain something first. You need to comply with a formality, and that formality is that you need a license. You need a license before you can drive legally. If you drive and you don't have a license, then you could face some really stiff penalties, including getting a ticket or, or even worse. And that's what a formality is. It's something you need to comply with before you are able to do something else. In the U.S., under U.S. copyright law, we had formalities in place too. Failing to comply with those formalities came with some strict penalties. In many situations, the failure to comply meant that the work entered the public domain immediately upon failure to comply with the rules. Because of the harsh nature of these formalities, these rules became known as traps for the unwary. That's traps for the unwary. We're going to cover two of the most relevant formalities out there, but these formalities can be used to find works that are in the public domain in your collections. It's important to note that the formalities that we're going to be talking about apply only when the work is published. Publication in this case means that the copyright owner has authorized a copy to be sold, leased, loaned, given away, or otherwise made available to the public without restriction. For a time in our copyright law, publication triggered the two formalities that I'll be focused on, but remember as we go through formalities, it applies solely to works that are published. The first formality is notice. Uh, for many, for published works in the U.S., they had to take, this notice had to take uh, the proper form and be placed in the correct place. So proper form here is exactly what you see on your screen. A copyright notice, or the COPR, or the word copyright, uh, with a date of publication, in this case 2016, and the name of the rights holder, in this case me. These notices uh, had to be placed in specific places, and these places are prescribed by law. So for books and printed publications, it needed to be on the title page. For musical works, it needed to be on the title page or the first page of music, etc. There are places prescribed by law, but it had to comply with both of those. Failure to comply with these rules triggered some big problems for rights holders. From if the work was published between 1909 and 1978, failure to include that proper notice meant that the item was in the public domain at the moment of publication. From 1978 to 1989, if you had a work published during that window, the rules were relaxed a little bit, but it still had the same impact if those rules weren't followed. After 1989, we got rid of this requirement and there was no more notice required to be included in items for those items to be protected by copyright law. But you'll see, we'll, we have works that are in fact in the public domain that were published in 1988 in the United States. And that's because they failed to include the proper notice. The second formality that we're going to talk about is for renewal. So published works that were published before 1964 the copyright in those works had to be renewed 28 years from the date of publication or registration, whichever happened first. These renewal records uh, are easily searchable and they were compiled by the Copyright Office. Uh, not easily searchable, but, but they are at least made available. So these, the renewal records originally were in a printed form and then they switched to microfilm and only recently has the Internet Archive partnered with the Copyright Office to digitize these, these catalog of copyright entries where you'll find renewal records. Some have taken these records and created searchable databases for particular classes like Stanford's Book Renewal Database. And we'll talk more about Stanford's renewal database here in a little bit. So if you didn't renew during a particular window, your work was in the public domain. Now I should note here that, again, remind you that these formalities apply only to works published in the U.S. Works that were published outside the U.S. didn't necessarily have to comply with these formalities, and there are some rules around when those copyrights, uh, how those copyrights are calculated today. Although this sounds a little complicated, we have rules, we have uh, uh, some helpful guides because others have gone before you. So the chart on the left is from Cornell, from Peter Hurdle. 
Uh, and Peter has a, 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 an entire PDF, an entire site dedicated to describing particular factual situations and telling you what the copyright status or how long that item is going to be protected by copyright law. The, this, the chart on the right is from the Sunstein Law Firm. Uh, for those of you who like flowcharts and decision trees as opposed to PDFs um, that require you to kind of page through it, uh, the, the chart on the right is for you. But in both of these situations, you need factual information to make the decisions, to make the determinations. And often this factual information is where we have the most trouble. For example, you're, you're looking at a letter uh, written in 1877 by Samuel Clemens. Often publication is an incredibly important fact, but, but looking at archival material like this, it's difficult to determine on the face of the object whether that item was subsequently published or is even in copyright protection today. So this letter written in 1877 was written by Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain. If this letter had never been published, it would be in the public domain today because Clemens died in 1910, which is more than 70 years ago. Remember, we're in a life plus 70 regime today. But there's a quirk in US copyright law, and it has to do with back with this chart. So the first three boxes here, 1790, 1831, and 1909, um, these publication, or publication triggered the clock uh, on counting down how long the item was going to be protected by federal copyright law. But federal copyright law didn't protect unpublished works, only state law did. And state law during these times, before 1976, held the copyright in unpublished works lasts forever. In 1976, when Congress wanted to switch to a Life Plus regime, they needed to bring unpublished works under into federal protection. But adding these works into federal protection would shorten the term of protection uh, of forever that they had previously enjoyed. So they created, Congress created a compromise. They said that unpublished works would, would enjoy, would be brought into the federal protection scheme um, and enjoy federal protection at least until 2003 if the rights holders did nothing. But if the rights holders wanted to extend copyright protection for more years, they could do so by publishing these previously unpublished works during a certain 25-year window. And if they did that, the copyright would be extended to at least 2047. So this sounds complicated. It's because it is. Uh, this, this kind of compromise that Congress struck wasn't actually utilized by very many people. The Clemens estate was, in fact, one of the few sophisticated estates that took advantage of this rule. They found as many unpublished works written by Clemens as they could and published them in 2002, right before the window shut. They actually came to NYPL and found some unpublished copies of letters in our collections and included them in the publication. That means that this letter that was written 18, in 1877 will in fact be protected by copyright law until 2048 for 170 years. Now, if you think back to that first session when we talked about the purpose of copyright law, the constitutional purpose, uh, the constitutional instruction to Congress was to create laws that protected copyright law or copyrights for a limited amount of time. Uh, you can question whether 170 years is a limited amount of time or not, um, but I'll leave that to you. If you want to learn more about this quirk in copyright law that I tried to just really quickly cover, I really recommend an article by Professor Anthony Reese titled Public but Private Copyrights New Unpublished Public Domain. And we'll include a link to that article on the DPLA workshops page. So the Clemens estate was one of the few estates who took advantage of this quirk in law, but there isn't some master list to refer to of the other estates who might have taken advantage of it. That's what makes this kind of determination, copyright determination and archival material so difficult. Sometimes we're missing really important facts that'll help us determine the duration of protection. All right, shifting gears slightly, there's another set of works that are in the public domain in the United States, and those are the works published by the federal government. Uh, works prepared by an officer or employee of the federal government as part of that person's official duties are in fact in the public domain in the United States. For example, the census report or the recommendations published by the Copyright Office, those things are in the public domain in the United States. 
I will note, however, that the U.S. government may own rights under foreign copyright laws in foreign countries. Whether they will enforce those rights or not is, seems, it remains unclear. I'll also note that city, state, and local government works may still be protected by copyright law. The provision in copyright law that says that federal copyrights, uh, copyrights don't, don't apply to works created by the federal government doesn't include city, state, and local governments. Many city, state, and local governments, though, have chosen to make their, their works available to the public for free and often sometimes without restriction. All right, so let's talk through some of the vanilla public domain statements that are available to you as you think about how to apply these statements um, to the works in your collections. So the first statement is the public domain mark. When you, you see this mark, it means that the work has been identified as being free of known restrictions under copyright law, including all related and neighboring rights. Creative Commons recommends applying this public domain mark only to works that are free of known copyright around the world. And really, that means very old works. It's not recommended for works that are in copyright in foreign jurisdictions. And when we're talking about failure to comply with formalities, those failure to comply, those works that failure to com fail to comply, are likely not eligible to be marked as a, with a public domain mark. They're simply too young. The second public domain statement is the item is in the public domain under the laws of the United States but a determination was not made as to its copyright status under the laws of other countries. This is our public domain U.S. statement. It sounds exactly like it is. And the third statement, which is kind of a, a quasi-public domain other statement, is the no known copyright statement. It means that the data provider believes that no copyright or related rights are known to exist for the item, but that a conclusive determination couldn't be made. This statement isn't as definitive as public domain U.S. or public domain mark, and therefore is, is likely less useful to our users, but it still is important uh, if you're, you're deciding between no known copyright and undetermined. The reason why institutions will apply the statement is because they may be missing one key fact. In the U.S., that may be the publication status for manuscript archival material. In other countries, it may be the death date for one or more of the authors is missing, but all indications are that enough time has passed uh, and that it appears that everyone has died more than the prescribed amount of time. So this constellation of public domain statements or quasi-public domain statements um, will apply in a given situation based on you, a mix of your confidence in your analysis plus any local policies. Emily described earlier how um, local rules and kind of local interpretations and local risk analysis will really weigh, factor into which of these statements you use. So let's compare and contrast real quick between the no known copyright and no copyright US. The key difference here is whether you actually have particular evidence or fact that this work is in the public domain. If you have that particular fact or key piece of evidence, then I would recommend applying no copyright US. If it's a really old work, then you might even apply public domain, the public domain mark. NYPL intends to exploit all three of these statements, but because we do not typically evaluate for foreign copyright, we'll likely be using the no copyright US the most, hev most heavily um, among these three. There are other uh, public domain statements I want to highlight quickly, and these two statements, the no copyright contractual restrictions and no copyright non-commercial uses, um, are really generated based on copyright law, a mix of copyright law and, and contract law. Remember that contract law can change the defaults that we have in copyright law, and that when we have institutions that agree to put restrictions on their public domain material, um, you'll get these statements uh, applied. Uh, in both situations, we recommend that the, the institution who's applying these statements include information on their website about what the particular restrictions are so that users have more information about how they might be able to use these objects. The other no copyright statement is other legal restrictions apply. Again, it was intended to capture situations where there are copyright-like restrictions, copyright -like restrictions in law that prevent the full reuse of an item. For example, in some countries, expressions of First Nations or traditional cultural expressions may be protected by copyright or a copyright-like system, but not necessarily by copyright law directly. We don't anticipate many U.S. institutions using this statement, but we may be surprised. 
Okay, moving off of the public domain, let's talk about the in copyright statements. So these statements will be applied when an item is protected by copyright law, um, but the, the item is made, made available to users either under an agreement with rights holders or by utilizing exceptions and limitations in the law. Primarily, we expect fair use, but there may be other exceptions and limitations that people want to rely on. So the first uh, statement here is in copyright, and this is again the plain vanilla in copyright statement. It means exactly what it says. You can refer back to the last session from an in-depth conversation about what is and isn't protected by copyright law, but generally we expect this statement to be applied whenever uh, the item is in copyright and there aren't other uh, uses permitted or other kind of factors in play here. For in copyright educational use permitted and in copyright non-commercial uses permitted, we again see contracts at work. In this case, the rights holder is authorized institution to allow third parties to use the works for educational uses or for non-commercial uses without the need to re-obtain permission from the rights holders. Remember that only the rights holders can grant this permission for in copyright works, but they can then pass that permission to the, to the institution who can then make it available to, to the world. Again, in these circumstances, we, we hope that institutions will, and expect that institutions will be clear about what the educational uses are, what the scope of those educational uses might be, or what the scope of the non-commercial uses might be on their website. Another statement is the unknown rights holder statement, and uh, the last in copyright statement that we expect our institutions to use um, is this in copyright rights holder unlocatable or unidentifiable. It's otherwise known as the orphan works statement. And this is kind of an odd statement for U.S. institutions because there is no legally recognized class of orphan works under U.S. law. We're not like the EU has a, who has a directive who has a special classification for uh, orphan works. In the U.S. we just don't have that special legal status. However, there's been lots of debate over the last 10 to 15 years about orphan works and there's been many proposals uh, to identify and uh, deal with the orphan works problem in the U.S. We do anticipate using this, uh, in U.S. institutions using this statement when they want a way to more clearly identify works they believe to be orphaned. And by orphan, let me break that down a little bit. So what do I mean by orphaned? I mean works for which the rights holders cannot be located or more identified, usually after a reasonably diligent search. Reasonably diligent search isn't easily defined because it may be different depending on the nature of the item, when the item was created, etc. Some prefer the term hostage works to orphan works because these items are being held hostage due to copyright law. The problem of orphan works exacerbated by automatic copyright protection and ever increasing duration of copyright protection has been discussed for over a decade in the cultural heritage community. Congress nearly passed a law in 2008 to, to, give, rights, uh, to give institutions who use orphan works some cover, but it, never, it didn't ultimately pass Congress. Since then, though, libraries have gotten more comfortable with relying on fair use to make orphan works available online. We spent a few minutes last time talking about fair use, uh, but for those of you keeping score, you will notice that we don't have a statement that says, in copyright, fair use. And that's because we want to describe the copyright status of an object, not how the institution is using that object. That's why you're not going to see a in copyright, fair use statement anytime soon. And let's, let's do a little bit bit of a refresher on fair use, um, four factors that go into fair use. The first is the purpose and character of the use. Um, are you making commercial uses of the, of the item? Are you making transformative uses of the item? Are you using the work in a way that was not originally intended by the author or not predicted by the author? author? Are you adding new insights and new context? If you are, this factor may likely be a, a tend toward a finding of fair use. The second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is the work that you're using highly creative? Is it unpublished? Is it less creative and more factual like a phone book? If it's more like a phone book, then there's more latitude for you to use that, that work. The third factor is the amount used. How much of the work did you use? And was your use, was the amount that you used appropriate for the use that we discussed in the first factor? 
are you using enough or in an amount proportionate to your ultimate use of the item? And fourth, the market impact. What's the market impact if we allow your use to occur more readily? What's the impact on the, on, on the use or what's the impact of your use on the market for the original? In the last session, we talked about how parity, like the one on the right here, was adjudicated to be a fair use. It's important to note here that the movie, studio, the movie studio's use was transformative. They're trying to say something about the original photo on the, photo on the left and the Madonna-like pose that you see. But fair use isn't limited solely to parodical uses like this, this Leslie Nelson uh, poster. We've seen fair use happen in the cultural heritage sector, um, and especially lately we've had a, a couple of really important fair use cases. One of those cases was, was the Google Books project, um, and that, that decision just came out from the Supreme Court, or, or the non-decision just came out from the Supreme Court. So this project, for those of you who don't know, was announced in 2004 with lots of fanfare. Google said its mission was to organize the world's information. They were going to scan books from the research collections of, of the libraries, and their goal was to scan the books and make them searchable online. They did this by partnering with libraries. Uh, libraries had lots of books they wanted digitized, so they sent those books to Google. Google then scanned the books and sent a copy back to the library and kept a digital copy for itself. Google's copy would be used for two main purposes. First was to extract the text out of the books and use it as the basis for search. And second, to make small snippets available to users when they find, when the user searches for, for keywords. When this project was launched in 2004, it was immediately sued in 2005 by rights holders claiming that this project uh, was an infringement of their rights. A few years after trying to work out a settlement, the court ultimately held that Google's limited uses were fair uses because Google changed the purpose of the book. Instead of allowing users to read the book, Google only permitted users to search the book and display limited snippets in a way that would not allow users to actually get at the whole text of the book. The decision by the lower court was upheld by a circuit court, after which the Authors Guild asked the Supreme Court to weigh in. Last month in April, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case, leaving the circuit court's decision that Google's uses were fair to stand. That ended the lawsuit. So this is a pretty important case for cultural heritage communities when we're not actually transforming the works, we're not, we're not actually uh, doing the Leslie Nielsen shot, we are actually just copying the works and using them for different purposes. Another important uh, case in a separate but related case is the Hathi Trust case, where Hathi Trust was sued for making uses of copies. Again, libraries had books they wanted digitized, they sent them to Google, and Google sent copies, digital copies, back to libraries. But at the time, libraries couldn't really handle and preserve large files. They wanted to make the books accessible to a broader audience, and they wanted to find some efficiencies in aggregation. So Hathi Trust was born, and they contributed those copies to Hathi Trust. Hathi Trust makes uses of incopyright works in various ways. They use the digital assets to drive a search engine as, to search the full text of books. The search engine allows users to see how many times a particular word or phrase appears in a book if the book is in copyright. I should note that HathiTrust doesn't actually show snippets, unlike Google Books, um, but they do allow you to search the book and see where uh, the words, how many times the word appears on a particular page. I should also uh, note that the second, the second use was to support uh, access for readers who, have blind, who are blind or print dis disabled. The digitized text was converted into a format that's accessible for print disabled users, and they were then able to read the in copyright books. Again, this, uh, the courts ended up holding, upholding these uses as fair uses. The court said that the, the use as a full text search was a fair use because the original purpose of the book was to be read, not to be fodder for a full text search engine. Um, Hadi also used text in transformative ways by not allowing humans to read the text, but to permit searching across millions of volumes in a single click. The court also found Hadi's use of digital copies for readers who are blind or had print disabilities was a fair use. 
here it was important to note that although these things weren't transformative uses, these were in fact format shifting for blind and print disabled users, and these were consistent with what Congress intended uh, to be encompassed and protected by fair use. I should also note that in both the Hadi case and the Google case, um, added, both Google and Hadi took security measures to protect those digital files. One more uh, example of a fair use that I'm uh, happy to talk about is, is NYPL's use of a collection from the New York World's Fair um, from the 1939-1940 World's Fair. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there were over 45 million people who visited uh, the World's Fair from 1939 to 1940, and it was held in New York. The collection is heavily used by researchers at NYPL, and we have over 2,500 boxes of records and documents, and over 12,000 photos. When we were thinking about how to use these collections, there were some questions about whether we can make these, question, these items available online or make other interesting uses. In the absolute worst case scenario, under maximum statutory damages, we could be liable for some 1.8 billion, billion with a B, in damages. So we researched the collection to understand the copyright issues and attempted to locate rights holders. After spending a day searching corporate records, we were unable to locate a rights holder. Therefore, we think these things are orphaned works, and we made uses of these items. Um, we made them available online, we built a website around these things, and even released an app that was named one of the top educational apps for 2011. So for all these reasons, we would likely apply, we will apply the unknown rights holder statement to these, this collection. Um, even though they don't have a distinct legal status, we think that this information is likely helpful for our users. If you have more questions about fair use, there are some good best practice guidelines out there. Um, they help explain fair use uh, for common and recurrent, recurrent uses. They give tips on activities that enhance or detract from the fair use arguments, and they are created by and for our community. Uh, another statement here uh, is the copyright not evaluated statement. Um, in some cases, your institution may decide that your use is a fair use and therefore elect not to uh, make copyright status determinations. In those cases, you might apply the copyright not evaluated statement, but I'll caution you on using the statement too liberally. Um, if you're not even thinking about the copyright status of objects you want to make available online, that's not really a great practice when you're thinking about your risk tolerance. All right, before we uh, take questions here in a few minutes, I want to apply the theory we've learned over the last two sessions to some actual examples. So this uh, is an insurance map uh, from Frankfurt, Kentucky. It's a Sanborn map published in 1901. Um, because this book, the, uh, this map was published in 1901, there are a few different copyright statuses we could apply. Um, I probably wouldn't apply the public domain status because this item is likely not old enough to be in the public domain in every country in the world. The no known copyright statement is also kind of dubious to me because we aren't missing any key information that would prevent us from making a more solid determination. So in this case, I would suggest applying no copyright United States. I know from Peter Hurdle's chart that works published before 1923 are public domain in the United States, and therefore I would select no copyright United States. A second example is this. This is an introduction to plant physiology. It was published in 1950 in New York. That means both, formal, both of the formalities we discussed earlier today will apply. The first thing I'd want to check is to see whether the work was published in the United States. And in fact, it was. And because it's published in the United States, it has to comply with formalities. The first notice, the first formality is notice. And as you can see on the screen, they've, they have an accurate copyright notice in the right place. Therefore, the notice is good. So then I'll check for renewal, and I can search Stanford's copyright renewal database for books. Um, Stanford's database is great if you're looking for the renewal status of books. Um, and, and in this case, I did a search and was unable to find a record in the database. So which statement should I apply? So again, public domain mark is probably not appropriate for this situation. This book is likely too young, far too young, to have the public domain notice included. Um, again, I probably wouldn't select a no known for the same reason, or for, for a different reason. Um, given the age of the book, it's, there's, I, I know what the copyright status of the book is, and therefore I would apply the no copyright US because I have confidence in Stanford's database um, that told me that there was no renewal for this book. 
Therefore, I would apply no copyright public or uh, no copyright in the United States or no copyright in the United States. The last example is this photo of Ruth St. Dennis, a famous dancer. The metadata tells me that this thing was created in between 1912 and 1913. The item itself is an archival print, it's a photo print, and the, the photos are coming from an archival collection of personal papers. The photographer is not known and it's not indicated on the, the photograph. The first question I would ask here is whether the, thing, whether the photo was published, and in this case it's not totally clear. There's no evidence that this photo was distributed widely. We did reverse image searches, reverse image searches on this photo and couldn't find an obvious um, copy out there. Um, but regardless, let's game out each scenario. So if we found evidence that the photo was distributed widely, you'd have a few choices. Depending on whether you can tell whether the photo was published, you might be tempted to use a no copyright US. I, again, there's no, uh, based on the publication date or the creation date, it's, it could be in the public domain of the United States. You might also apply the no known rights statement, depending on whether you believe the photographer died before 1945, um, or whether you believe the item was published before 1923. If you find no evidence of broad distribution, then you might believe the photo was never published. And in that case, it could be in copyright today because of the quirk that we just talked about. You might even be tempted to use in copyright rights holder unlocatable or unidentifiable, the orphan work statement. Um, your choice here really depends on your level of confidence in the publication status of the photo and the particular, particular factual in for inferences you feel comfortable drawing from your metadata. I might use the copyright undetermined uh, for this statement because it's just simply not clear enough to me whether the photo was published or not and what, who the photographer was and whether that person died before 1945. Therefore, I'm not sure which statement I, I would exactly use. So that concludes the prepared content for these sessions. I recognize that we covered a lot in these sessions, but as you get into making these determinations, you'll uncover even more questions. You may need to dig deeper into the law to understand whether your use is a fair use or whether the copyright in a foreign publication was restored in the US under Section 104A. You will not be the first to encounter these questions. There are really good resources online. There's a blog out there called Library Law uh, that, that blog gets into some of the more particular situations, the more edge case situations you're likely to encounter. Remember that our goal here is to have accurate and useful statements so that our users feel empowered to make good decisions about how they can use the cultural heritage they find online. We want to make accurate statements, not quick and dirty statements that don't necessarily help all you, our users get anywhere. So thanks for listening for the, the last uh, three, uh, three, two sessions and three hours in total. I'm going to turn this back over to Kenny for, for some questions um, that have maybe have come in during our session. So back over to you, Kenny. Thanks, Greg. Um, so we got a number of questions over the course of the webinar. Um, we have about seven minutes remaining, so we will likely um, only be able to get to a couple of them. But as I mentioned, we will respond to them offline and post them to the workshop page after the fact. The, <clears throat> the first question that I have here um, might be for Emily. Um, if you are a content hub, do you need to ask uh, your partners who already contributed content through your hub to update their right statements for images currently in DPLA, or is this applicable only to new content that comes to use um, into DPLA? So, yes, we are doing retrospective work. So. Um, it, it would be um, for all of our hubs, content and service hubs, and it would, um, you know, need to certainly um, look at the con look at the data that's already there as well as the data going forward. It may certainly be easier for you to start with data going forward and then go back and do a retrospective look, um, and that's fine. You could certainly have a you know a piecemeal strategy where some of your data has the rights right statements um, from rightstatements.org and, and the, the rest of it gets it over time. Um, but that's something we can certainly discuss with you on an individual basis and, and make the determination um, around your particular case. So it's something you can feel free to reach out to me about and we can kind of talk about your particular case. Thanks, Emily. Um, another question here. <clears throat> 
We have items in the public domain but charge a fee for the high resolution digital file and the license fee. Is that wrong? We don't let anyone use our items and most of our contributors do not want their items out there for free use. We'd love to know how to get an answer or guidance on this. So Emily, I'll take this one for a little bit. So NYPL was in the same situation for, for a long time. We have items that were in the public domain, but charged an access fee to the high resolution version of that, that item. And to be honest, that, that, that isn't a necessarily a wrong um, practice. It's a practice that's been going on for a long time. It does, though, in, encumber or limit how our users can use the public domain. So in January, NYPL ended up releasing over 190,000 high-resolution images uh, that were in the public domain for free without any restriction. We recognize that that means we took a little bit of a hit on the revenue side, but we thought that that was consistent with our mission and that it was important to our mission to make those items more broadly available. So uh, I think there's a conversation that can be had with, with local hubs um, and with smaller hubs who depend on that revenue um, to talk about whether that revenue is worth kind of the, the risks to mission that we are, are seeing more and more of. And I think um, just to add a little bit to what Greg said, I think the analysis of the um, actual revenue that you get versus the time spent um, in, in creating the digital objects and pulling them and sharing them instead of just making them broadly available. I think um, analyzing that for you locally, I, I think if, if um, you know, in NYPL's case, obviously they have probably a lot more public domain images than, than a number of us do, um, and, and yet they were able to kind of justify being able to put that online. I'd also argue philosophically that materials in the public domain belong to the public. Yes, we have, um, or at your institutions, you have put the work in to scan that and, and to provide that metadata, um, but I think as cultural heritage institutions, um, we should try to share the best possible um, copy that we can of materials that belong to the public. Emily, um, might have question for, uh, sorry, time for just one more. Um, got one in just now. Um, you mentioned at the start that you had statements about privacy, trademark, publicity, and other rights that attach to the various works. Is there a concern that omitting these statements could be deceptive, i.e., will people see public domain and think it is fine to use? Why did you not include a separate statement for other rights, not just no copyright, other known legal restrictions, but also copyright and other known legal restrictions? Yeah, so I, the concern here, I think, for us was that if we had uh, a no copyright trademark, no copyright privacy, no copyright publicity, we would start to have uh, many more rights statements than we really wanted or intended to. Um, so we do try to make it as clear as we can to users that, that those rights aren't reviewed. And it's also, it's kind of hard to review an object for trademark issues when when the use of the object in most cases isn't going to trigger a trademark claim. So so the your use of a, a, a public domain photo that happens to include Coca-Cola's trademark likely isn't going to implicate uh, trademark rights that Coca-Cola may have um, in most circumstances. So we thought that adding that extra information would actually cause users to be more confused um, and actually uh, not understand uh, or, or more restrict their, their use than, than necessary, than, than the law requires. So that's why we didn't include a, a separate statement about trademark or rights of publicity, because those rights really apply in specific situations and aren't kind of a global uh, restriction, or a global by global, I mean uh, a restriction that applies to almost every use. Thanks, Greg. Um, it is now I see 5 o'clock Eastern, um, so we're going to wrap up here. We had a number of other questions uh, that folks submitted, so we will review those and answer them and post them to the workshops page um, by the end of the week. We also have recorded this session and the previous session, and we'll post that to the workshops page on dp.la slash info um, by the end of the week, so check that out. We will also announce that over Twitter and email you as well. Um, thank you so much for attending this webinar and the previous webinar, if you are able to make it. Um, we look forward to seeing you again on another DPLA workshop. Have a great rest of your day.